Hi gang, Rob here. It is the evening of 20 March 2017 and I'm pretty excited to bring you guys this video tonight. Those of you who have been with me, subscribers on the Apostle P channel for a while, know that there has been a knife design kicking around in my head for, oh gosh, I don't know, years. <laughs> And you've seen the early stages of the reality of this knife. Uh, you've heard me talk about it. You've seen a, a, a custom pre-prototype that I built with Jesse Hempel of Uncle Jesse's Knives in Damascus steel. Uh, what, in January? You've seen this drawing before? Uh-huh. You've heard a couple different names for this knife. You've heard it called Everyday Bowie. You've heard Gunny Bowie. Now you've heard the last and final name, the Gunny Sidekick. Well, it's existed in a pre-prototype and it's existed in a drawing. But as of this past weekend, the Gunny Sidekick became a prototype reality at the March grind in at Bark River Knives and here it is my friends here it is with its four inch swedged clip point blade made at the Bark River Knives Ice N 2017 the uh, prototype done in black canvas micarta polished but this one is not Mike's. This one is mine because it has red liners. I showed this to Mike as it was being completed and I said, it's not yours. And I flipped it and showed him the spine. He goes, oh, I see that. You sexed it up with those red liners. <laughs> so here it is, guys. Here it is. I think it cuts. We sort of had it done at the grind, and then I brought it home and had to do a couple things to it, like sharpen it. <laughs> Before we talk about it in detail, though, I'm going to show you guys a little video collage of how it got made. So we'll, uh, we'll show you that. It'll take a couple minutes, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Well, here it is, guys. The prototype of the gunny sidekick. You got a piece of surface ground, 150,000 A2 for the prototype. Black my car to handle. We're going to drill the holes in the right location and we'll start making the blade. Start drilling the holes in our handle. Using the black micarta handle as a template. Notice we drilled one hole arc, put a pin in to look, perfectly locate that while we're still moving on to the second one. This is John Blossom roughing out the blade out of this hard A2 bar. Good looking spark tower, John. Okay, guys, here's the rough blade. And what we're doing now, we've cut some red liner material. We're gluing that to the black canvas micarta. And we're going to glue up the handle. Okay, we're assembling the handle. A little Loctite activator sprayed on all the components. Hey Ricky, did you do this one? No. 
No, I don't. Don't take it. No problem. I'm just making sure I'm right before I start talking. Hey, are those the right corners? Yeah. Yeah, I already gave it to you. Oh, you gave it to me? Right. Oh, you're right now. Around the outside. You gotta get drilled though. Did you do this one? Make sure the Corby bolts are assembled now, we're clamping it. Leave that glue set up for a little bit, and then we'll take it out and finish the play. And now we're finishing the handle, that.
that folks going with? Yeah, we got Because our blade is drowned. We got Josh bringing it home now. Michael ground our primary convex level and sled. Ground it super thin. Now we'll put the final finish on. We're gonna put that on it. Down to the 240 here. If that would just get out of your way, right? <laughs> My knife designing idol is a guy named Jim Stewart. You think I'll, you think I'll ever be as good as him, Josh? I think you can manage. Okay, so let me explain sort of how the weekend went with the prototype gunny sidekick. I got to uh, Escanaba about noon on Friday and went to Mike's office and exchanged pleasantries and shot the bull for a little bit. I asked, uh, <laughs> I had reason to, to ask. I said, so, do we have a water jetted blank yet for the gunny sidekick? And he went, we have hardened A2 bar. <laughs> so we didn't have a, a water jetted blank. And frankly, that is not Mike's fault or Bark River's fault. I sort of waited before I, uh, before I started pressing for this, this project. And by the time Mike and Derek Bone and I decided to go ahead and do it, um, it was only a couple weeks before the grind in. Not only that, but most of the Bark River, shall we call them, executive staff, um, that would be Jim Stewart, Jackie Stewart, and Nick Troutman, the engineer, they were all in Germany for the EWA show. And Nick didn't get back until... A week before grind in and he's the guy that would have had to put this in CAD and sort of shotgun the water jet of a blank and he just plain didn't have time to do it uh, which was fine so I thought no problem we'll just use some 530 seconds a2 stock and everything will be cool well you know funny thing happened on the way to the forum uh, there was no 530 seconds a2 there was no 530 seconds anything of enough size to make this knife. So I did find a piece of 3 16 and this knife needed to be 530 seconds. So I grabbed the 3 16 bar, uh, searched the shop high and low to find Zoe Christ, whose new shop is just a mile away from, uh, uh, from Bark River. And I knew that he had a Blanchard grinder and a surface grinder. So uh, I begged him, and he took my little chunk of bar, uh, surface ground it down to 150. That's 150 thousandths of an inch uh, for you guys in Europe. That's six thousandths shy of 530 seconds of an inch, and a little bit shy of four millimeters. Okay, are we all, we all good now? Heads are done swimming? Okay. <clears throat> so that's... That is the stock we made this knife from, 150 thousandths A2, okay? And I had to sort of wait around and took a little video, and you guys will see like a Bark River Grinding Weekend video scrapbook. Uh, and then Zoe got back and we went to town. So the, the first thing was to, uh, to draw my pattern on my bar. And if you notice in the, in the little video collage there, there were three holes drilled in my bar. That's Those are just there. I don't know what pattern they are, but they weren't my pattern. Uh, those are there so the guys at the heat treat know um, which end to make a little softer. Okay, So I had to make a copy of this blueprint, cut out my knife, 
lay it over the bar, draw the pattern. Then we had to drill some holes so the, the gunny handle would be correctly located. Um, went out in the shop, and most of these operations, if you looked at the, uh, the video there, were not done by me because I, I had two other responsibilities during the making of this knife. I had to, uh, I had to keep checking it to print, number one, and I was shooting video. Uh, so a, a couple guys, more than a couple guys, helped me. Um, let's see, Art in the handle shop at Bark River helped a lot. Uh, John Blossus did my rough grind of the outer envelope package, the rough shape of the knife. Uh, Rob at the hafting, at the hafting line uh, shaped my handle for me. Then a couple other guys polished it. Then Michael did the main bevel grind, and Josh did the sharpening, uh, and that's how we ended up where we are. I did a couple minor operations in handle assembly. I was the guy who finished the front of the handle scales before we glued the knife together. And I'm also the guy who brought it home. Um, and frankly, the shop was a madhouse. The grinding line was crazy. I didn't want to hold everybody up. We got it close. I called it good. Uh, when I got home, I did have to come make the choil to print. And this isn't, again, this is not the guys at Bark River's fault. This is my fault. Uh, I had Michael, and I said to him, I want you to grind this primary convex bevel as thin as you are comfortable with. And we didn't, and guys, it is very difficult to do this full convex from bar stock, hardened bar stock. You know, most Bark River knives are flat bevel ground before they go to the convex grinding line. So most of the material is already removed. They're just shaping it. So Michael had to go from full thickness bar stock to finished convex grind. And what we ended up with was a pretty consistent thickness from tip to about here and you guys who grind knives know the most challenging part of a knife is trying to get the plunge grind and the base right. Uh, so we got a little thin back here and since it wasn't one guy taking this piece of bar from start to finish when we handed it off to Josh at the sharpening line I don't think he really realized how thin we were back here. We lost about a sixteenth of blade height at the base and about none through here. In fact, it might have been a little overly broad. Um, so where we are now is pretty thin here, pretty thin here, and there's a bit of a bulge right through here. And I think if you look at the width of my sort of convex edge bevel, you can see that. It gets a little broad through here. So what we had was a, a, a pronounced belly out to here, and then it looked like it sort of upswept and then had a little recurve. So I had to, I had to get rid of that and make it right. So we're about a 30 second shy of my uh, 1 and 3 30 seconds height dimension. That's okay. It's a prototype. It still looks pretty doggone good, I think. Um, I've been carrying this and using it all day today. And I'm here to tell you guys, with its 4-inch blade, so about 1 and a 16th high, and it's 4 and, uh, we'll say, 5 eighths handle. Still slim enough to be super carryable. I don't know what it weighs. Shall we look? I think we shall. Let's talk amongst yourselves. You get the scale up and give it a little give it a little way. Come on. Uh oh, there we go. So 5.6 ounces. Let's see, that's about the weight of a Hinder XM18 with a longer blade 
And I don't know, what do you, what do you guys think? You think maybe it's stronger? <laughs> I think it might be. What a versatile blade shape. I did split a little kindling with that. Um, opened some envelopes today. Uh, broke down some cardboard. Opened some cardboard boxes with it. Um, and you guys know what I think about this. I think that, that the Bowie knife or the clip point blade, the most versatile blade style there is. And you know, it's proving me right. So let's see. I really can't fault the design at all. <laughs> if I could fault it, I would have done it differently. Um, that's, you know, that's my perspective. I know you guys might have one that differs. Um, the execution, you know, the choil wasn't water jet, so we didn't really have ready-made cutting tools to make that right. So I, I, I sort of waited and brought it back to what I was comfortable with in my own shop that I knew I could make it right with, so, which is a Dremel tool on the edge of a 1x30 belt. Um, had to finish this area of the knife off. Yeah, I don't know. There, there's a probably a, that could be better. Just a little. I can feel a little bit where the tang is. Other than that, we just nailed it. I, w I would say this on one side of the knife. So this would be the worst side, where the flat transitions to the convex, and then on this side it's pretty good. So. If you're right-handed, it's better. <laughs> of course, the production knives will be on the money because the bevel grind will be perfect and the convexer will just be blending that. Um, so, now when, we, when they packed me up after the grind in, and I didn't really specify um, to the girls in the sheath shop what I wanted. So what they sent me home with was this sheath, which is... Um, not a fold over, but a sort of pancake style of pouch sheath. I got a little Obanoffs on here that didn't quite dry yet. And the knife would carry thusly, and it does have a fire steel loop. This sheath uh, I kind of like for a couple reasons. I think the stitching and the tooling are attractive. Uh, the, the sort of reinforcing uh, top section up here I really like. That knife is definitely never ever going to come out of there. Um, I like the fact that it's ambidextrous. Same sheath can be worn and carried by right-handers and left-handers alike. I like how deep the knife carries in that sheath. Still plenty sticking out so you can get a middle finger on it and pull it out. Uh, it sits very flat against your body. It does take up a little, a little girth in this dimension. Um, so the other sheath that I'm considering and you guys are going to have to help us out in the comments here. This is the fold-over style bushcraft pouch style sheath. And this is one that came with my Springbok. I carry my Springbok and my Gunny Hunter in this a lot. So I knew that it would work well for this knife. I could go either way. Um, this has got an advantage because it's capable of vertical or cross draw carry. And it takes up a little less room in this dimension. But I could kind of go either way. Doesn't really matter to me. So I know what you guys are all wanting to hear. I told you this weekend would be the weekend where we not only prototype the knife, but this would be the weekend where we decide what steel we're making it out of. And we didn't have much discussion. I thought I was going to get to watch Derek and Mike sort of argue. Because they both had strong opinions about what we should use. But I got it all done. Prototyped in A2. And when I walked into Mike's office... He said, okay, I'll have Nick get it in CAD and get your M4 ordered this week. 
So it's going to be CPM M4. Hardened 2. RC 62 to 64. And you know, guys, now that you see it in person, remember, CPM M4 still a much tougher steel than S35, M390, 20CV, LMAX, all of those steels. Not as tough as 3V, but it's a 4-inch blade with a 532nd spine. And it's only 4 inches long. I see no problem with M4. And frankly, <clears throat> if uh, if my subscribers and you know my guys who follow me and appreciate my knife philosophy and my sharpening service, uh, you know if you're buying a knife that was designed by me, I don't think it's such a bad thing. Maybe I hope you won't either. That it's made in a steel that is best suited uh, for the work of a professional sharpener. I mean, do you have to send your gunny sidekick to me to make it sharp? No. But, you know, it's I'd be honored if you did. <laughs> so CPM M4 it shall be. When, when, Rob, will we see these knives? Well, I'm going to say I hope they're ready for hunting season, and I do mean hunting season 2017. I was joking with Ben Schwartz at KnifeNews.com. Let's say hunting season. Don't don't hold us to a year though. <laughs> but I think uh, they should be ready by hunting season this year. Hmm. As I've been sort of you know fondling this, not that I fondle my knives, but. As I've been fondling this over the last couple of days, I look at it and I think, and maybe I'm biased because it came out of my mind's eye, but I think, of all the knives I saw with black handles on the table at the Bark River Grinding last weekend, it just blows my mind that they haven't made this. And there's nothing new under the sun here. It's a classically styled clip point Bowie knife, four inches long, with a gunny handle. You would think. This has been, you'd think this had been a production knife at Bark River for 10 years, wouldn't you? They'd just never done it. There are sort of reasons that, <clears throat> although Mike appreciates the, the history of the Bowie knife and the clip point blade, there are reasons that he gravitates more toward classic hunting patterns. And even in knives that he makes with military themes, they don't look very military. Uh, the Bravo series, you know, almost a straight spine, slight drop point. There are things about the military and the military part of his life that he kind of wants to leave behind. But those of us who grew up, grew up with Buck 110s and Buck 119s and Western Bowies, uh, we love these. By the way, if you didn't know, it's superb in a variety of grips. I mean, superb. And if you got into a knife fight, could you use it? I think you could. Pricing, well, you guys know how that works. <clears throat> you guys know how much Bark River knives cost. And it's not going to be an A2. It's going to have the normal variety of Bark River handle materials. So, uh, M4 knives from Bark River are probably going to start north of $200. And, you know, if you go with some exotic, you know, exotic handle material like desert ironwood burl and you put liners in it and mosaic pins, it's very possible, I think, that this knife could run you north of $300. So, they will be sold exclusively by KnifeShipFree.com, Derek Bones Company, and he normally, with very, uh, maybe never, maybe with no exceptions, uh, 
he normally does not have an early reserve or a pre-order system so he and I will try to keep coordinated as the day approaches and give you guys uh, an ample warning announcement video with the date and time these are going to go on sale and we will try to stick to that stick to that schedule and to give everybody an equal shot of being able to come up with one of these they're going to make 150 of them for us I think it's pretty special so stay tuned I will get I will keep you guys apprised of any developments as they happen I'm pretty excited by the way. Pretty doggone excited. Freaking love this knife. That's all for now guys. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember the word and my gunny sidekick are sharp.